So thank you very much and hello everyone. Uh, I'll start with some introductions. So my name's Will Dixon. Uh, I'm both a rheumatologist at Salford Royal Hospital and an epidemiologist at the University of Manchester. Uh, these roles are really complementary uh, and useful together. During my clinical care, I can understand the things that matter to patients, uh, particularly where we don't know those answers. Questions like, why did I get this disease? Now that I have it, what does the future hold for me? And what's the best treatment that you can offer? Sometimes where we don't know those answers, we can do research to get the answers. And often epidemiology is a good way of answering such questions analyzing data across populations, uh, and then we can bring those results back into the clinic to improve clinical care. Uh, I'm gonna talk uh, during this talk about uh, work that is, I guess, more strongly influenced by my clinical care, but also feeds research, which we'll touch on at the end of the talk. But let's have a window into one of my consultations. Here I am with the patient, and as often is the case, we open the consultation with this question. How have you been in the last six months? Let's just look at what happened to this patient. Ten weeks ago, uh, her arthritis had been stable, but she just started to develop some twinges across her, her metacarpophalangeal joints and pain in her hands. In fact, things got so bad uh, uh, a couple of weeks later that she was struggling to uh, use a knife and fork and perform even simple tasks. Uh, so much so that she started to wonder whether it could possibly be her rheumatoid arthritis, things were so unmanageable. But thankfully, things did pass and three weeks ago, she was able to go back to the school run and back to her daily life uh, and today she is now coming into clinic, but unfortunately gets caught up in the car parking chaos at the hospital and then in the waiting room uh, and all of the complications of booking in and uh, clinics overrunning. Um, and here she is back in the clinic, having had all of that experience. And she says, oh, all right, I suppose. And on the basis of that information, we have to make the best possible decisions about her treatment. And yet we know that there are all sorts of things that, well, we now know, now know uh, with that uh, window into our life, what, what's been happening. Why is it that it's difficult to explain? Well, recall is influenced by your recent history. You hear all of the stress of the car parking in the outpatient, uh, uh, outpatient department. Um, it's hard to summarize something that fluctuates significantly through time. So how do you describe all of those ups and downs over such a long time period? Of course, it's difficult to convey symptoms and to describe it clearly. Um, here's a quote from one of our patients with rheumatoid arthritis. When you explain and their faces don't look as though it was bad and you think, well, was it really that bad? It's hard to describe. Time's too short, often clinics are overrunning, the doctors are pressurized, they want to get on with the consultation, they don't have the time to allow the patients to explain uh, in detail. What we want to know as doctors doesn't necessarily match what the patient wants to discuss, so we're often focusing in on people's disease severity, but patients may uh, want to describe other things or other ways in which they're trying to convey the same information. Uh, and lastly, patients often will try to ignore their symptoms day to day. They have to get on with life in the 99% of their time that they're not in the consultation room. Uh, here's another quote. I, I can't talk about what's going on because I forget. Yeah, I've been in pain. Yeah, this has been sore. Yeah, that's been sore. I can't remember for how many days because I just try and get on with it as much as I can. And that's completely understandable. Now, outpatient consultations, the way in which we uh, manage long term conditions in hospitals really just hasn't changed for the last century or more. Uh, this is a painting from Lowry's famous artist from from Salford, uh, from the waiting area that looks 70 years ago, much like it does today. But uh, things are changing a little. Here's a short video from the NHS.
to meet the needs of everyone. To be free at the point of delivery. To be accessed on need and not well. So the landscape is changing. Um, in the UK, the NHS long-term plan pledges that digitally enabled outpatient care will become mainstream across the NHS over the next five years. And this came out in 2018. Uh, so we're a long way into that already. Um, what does digitally enabled outpatient care mean? Well, they describe reducing the number of appointments, including avoiding unnecessary visits, providing choice in where and when to go, um, and supporting virtual care and remote monitoring. And as this uh, vision was launched back in 2018, these things like re remote monitoring, virtual care seemed slightly fantastical because it was breaking the model of outpatients that had existed for 100 years. But of course, with the pandemic, things have changed significantly uh, and remote monitoring has risen right to the top of everyone's uh, agenda. So what I'm going to describe in the rest of the talk is uh, our experience with the Remora study. Um, which has run in three phases, and I'll describe that uh, too. Um, essentially, Remora, or Remote Monitoring of Rheumatoid Arthritis, uh, is a research study, but integrated into clinical care, where we've been uh, asking patients to use a smartphone app to collect their daily symptoms, uh, integrated into their usual lives, uh, with rheumatoid arthritis, for three purposes, really. Um, Self-management, um, uh, clinical care and here uniquely we've integrated the symptoms into the electronic health record so it's viewable at the consultation uh, and then thirdly reusing that data uh, for research. So th these are the three phases we've uh, run the pilot study uh, from 2015 to 2017 and I, I've presented on this uh, previously at one of the, uh, the, the meetings here. Um, the current work that we've been doing over the last 18 months is developing infrastructure that's scalable uh, across the UK. And we're about to start uh, a program grant over the next four years that will develop evidence of whether or not this leads to better outcomes for patients. So first let's review the pilot study. Um, this ran in a few phases. There was uh, qualitative research, so interviews and focus groups with clinicians, researchers and patients where we designed the smartphone app to meet the, meet the needs of all of these three groups. We then did some testing uh, with a small number of patients to make sure that the data flowed properly into the electronic health record. And then with 20 patients, we tested the app over a period of three months with consultations at baseline uh, and at the end of the three month period. And then we did again, interviews and focus groups with all of the different uh, stakeholders to see how people had got on with the app. Uh, uh, afterwards. And we also audio, audio recorded consultations. So after the first phase, we developed the app to have a series of different question sets, uh, quick and easy questions on a daily basis. So how has your pain been on a scale of 0 to 10? Uh, so six of those different questions plus a question of morning stiffness. Um, weekly questions that were slightly more involved, self-reported tender and swollen joint counts, a patient global assessment, questions on work and whether the patient felt that they had had a flare in the last week. Uh, and lastly, the health assessment uh, questionnaire, a disability questionnaire on a monthly basis. So the app was just clean and simple, nothing fancy, uh, but uh, functionality that included a slider on the daily scores to score your pain or fatigue out of 10, 
uh, a stepper in the middle for weekly questions. So how many joints were tender or swollen? And then um, radio buttons for uh, the monthly questions where there were categorical responses. And here's some of the findings from Remora One. Uh, this was really interesting. Um, this patient had been tracking her symptoms um, in the evening following the notifications on the smartphone. Um, she lived um, together with her husband. They didn't talk much about her symptoms, but as she entered her symptoms each evening, her husband would look over her shoulder at what she was scoring within her app. Uh, she said, I'm not one that moans about being ill, but because it was every night, my partner would be like, how are you scoring today? And why didn't you say that your pain was that bad? And it did make more communication between us. So it changed the nature of uh, their relationship and how this patient managed her own rheumatoid arthritis and her, and her uh, communication with her family. The data that were integrated into clinical care were not viewed between consultations, and we made that clear to all of the participants, but we did view it at the next routine visit. And here are some examples of what happened at those consultations. So you'll see quotes, uh, uh, the quotes in black are from the clinician and the quotes in color are from the patients. So here uh, I'm seeing somebody after a month in the beta testing and at baseline, uh, this patient had uh, active disease and was given a steroid injection. And then at one month follow up, I'm asking how they've got on since then. And the patient says, the injection was great. By the time I was going home from work later on that day, I was feeling so much better. Okay, and how have your symptoms been over the last month since then? And they said, I've been fantastic. In fact, I feel a bit of a fraud for your research because it has just been steadily good. Any symptoms at all over the last month? No, other than the fact I just have a few limitations as to what I can do, but no actual pain. So let's have a look at your graph. And here you can see time going from left to right. The high score on the left is when they were struggling before they had the steroid injection. Uh, and then indeed they have been good, except for that flare in the middle of the graph. So the pain's between zero and one for the first seven to 10 days. And then you did have a couple of days where your pain was worse. And the patient said, yeah, I'd forgotten that. And you have to remember that this is a patient who has been tracking their symptoms uh, has access to their graphs and is coming to an audio recorded consultation uh, about remote monitoring and still they forget over a period of just one month. So what hope is there for people remembering their symptoms over six months? Here's the second patient over the same time period. Uh, this patient had been on a new biologic drug for a month prior to the baseline consultation. Uh, and we were waiting to see whether she did develop any response. And here I said, there's quite a significant day-to-day -day fluctuation, but it looks as you say that the extent of the fluctuation is going down. And the patient said much more eloquently than I did, it's funny on this, you can see the trend, can't you? And this was a pattern that neither the patient nor the doctor would have spotted without the benefit of this remote monitoring because the gradual trend was lost within that day-to-day -day fluctuation in symptoms. Uh, in the interviews, patients were very positive about the app. They thought it was a great idea, a brilliant thing, and I can't wait until it's out there properly. And of all of these daily symptoms, over 90% of possible entries were completed. Patients described data collection as capturing the moment, making those fleeting symptoms visible and picking up changes that would otherwise be missed. Those symptom graphs in the electronic health record made it easier for a shared conversation. The data says it for you, provides evidence and personalizes care. So you can read more about the results in this article from uh, Rheumatology from last year. And there's also a video alongside it that you can uh, have a look at. So we've talked about self-management and clinical care from the Remora One study. Um, and we're just doing analysis now of some of these daily symptom scores and periods of flare, answering questions like, can we start to understand what self-reported flares really mean, how they characterized? Can we identify flares? And importantly, can we identify pre-flare periods? So can we predict a flare 
And if you can predict a flare, then you can have what is increasingly being called a just-in-time intervention. You can intervene to help um, uh, prevent the flare or perhaps manage the flare better. Um, if we correlate the patient reported data with information from the clinical record, we can then also move on to quantify treatment response. So does A, drug A, work quicker than drug B? They may both work as well after three months or six months, but does one work uh, more rapidly? So we were really impressed by what had happened in Remora 1. Uh, it had transformative value, but we just developed sort of bespoke plumbing into one electronic health record and we couldn't scale it up as it was done. We had researchers in the clinic setting patients up with their smartphones. So we needed to develop scalable infrastructure. And so this is what we've been developing in the last 18 months. At a consultation, uh, a clinician can recommend to a patient that they should do remote monitoring. Uh, they can uh, advise the patient to visit the app store where they can download the Remora app. Um, they have to then authenticate as who they say they are, um, which in the UK perhaps isn't as advanced as it is elsewhere, but there is now a system called NHS Login, and we can link into national systems to do the authentication link to NHS data. Um, the symptom data, uh, a consent record is then sent into a patient-generated data repository, um, and from there, we do visualizations of patient level data so that we can see those trends with time. Previously, um, the data was pretending to be a blood result and using the functionality in the electronic health record. Now it's no longer directly in the health record. We have to develop this, this dashboard uh, for individual patients. And then we have a view onto that from the electronic health record, which means that it's scalable across different hospitals um, and with different electronic health record providers. So it sounds like it's all about tech, but it's not. Uh, as you try and implement this, there's a lot more that you have to do around the edges and a lot more sort of supporting materials. Uh, so participants uh, and patients have to be able to set up uh, the app at home and not everyone is as digitally literate as others. And so we've had to develop uh, onboarding instructions um, previously, we trained people in clinic about how to self-examine tender and swollen joint counts. And so now, as people do this remotely, we have to train them remotely, and we've developed a video for self-examination. And you can find this on YouTube, uh, and in fact, it's starting to be translated into multiple other languages too, uh, work that's been led by Charlotte Sharp. Um, we've been developing a patient dashboard, uh, so we brought in expertise in data visualisation. We've tested it with clinicians and patients to make sure it's understandable and relevant. And then we've also had to train up the clinicians to do something that they haven't previously done. So a one hour training session, frequently asked questions, documents, reminder notes so that you remember that there's something that you need to check that you haven't checked before. Uh, and then ongoing ad hoc training and feedback. So that takes us up to where we are now. Um, and in a few weeks, we'll be commencing a four year program to expand this to test whether their uh, integrated symptom tracking leads to better clinical outcomes. So uh, we have so far proved that clinicians and patients like this, but we want to show that it actually improves disease activity and, and long term uh, generates long term benefits. So we'll be doing this with uh, what's called a stepped wedge trial. Uh, we'll be recruiting all rheumatology departments in Greater Manchester and Northwest London. We're looking to recruit uh, patients uh, with rheumatoid arthritis who are smartphone owners, and then they'll be randomized to usual care or integrated symptom tracking. The step wedge trial means that the randomization refers to when a particular department switches over from usual care to symptom tracking uh, so that all departments get to experience the integrated symptom tracking and we have the potential to set up all of the sites uh, sequentially. Uh, patients are followed up through their usual clinical assessments, through the clinician reported information and then additional information collected from the patients. And essentially we're tr the primary outcome is do we have a greater improvement in DAS28 score in the patients with integrated symptom tracking versus those with usual clinical care. 
But within the Remora 2 program, uh, a whole load of other research being conducted as well, a health economic evaluation. So does it not just lead to better outcomes, but is it cost effective? Um, how do you implement this at scale? How do you roll out this sort of technology and all of the supporting materials to other hospitals? Uh, how do you scale it up to other disease areas? Um, we want the data to be available for research as well, as you saw right at the beginning, um, but we're not able to get patients to sign consent forms in clinic because it's all done remotely. And therefore we need to develop an e-consent module that allows patients to consent at baseline as they onboard into the system, that they will share their data both for clinical care and for research. And we have to expand all of those supporting materials as well, particularly thinking about digital inclusion and how do we uh, handle hard to reach groups, um, uh, perhaps those uh, with uh, different languages or different levels of deprivation. Uh, we've got plenty of research to do with the data as it comes out of the Remora system. So understanding these day-to-day -day rhythms of rheumatoid arthritis, assessing those short-term treatment responses uh, and predicting flares. Beyond this trial, so this is even beyond the next four years, we have to consider how we use patient-generated data in between clinic visits. I think everyone would appreciate that if you can see how people are, you may not need to bring everyone back to clinic at a six month appointment and you can space people out who are stable, uh, creating space for those who need it. Um, but it's quite it's more complicated than you might think, because you have to have an automated alert when somebody passes a threshold of disease activity. But what's that threshold? And clearly that's going to be different for different different individuals. Uh, if you can identify these pre-flare periods or early flare periods, can you enable just-in-time interventions and what might those interventions be? We can expand from self-reported data into other data types, so that might be images or sensor data. Um, it's a long-term condition. Will people track their symptoms forevermore every day? Probably not, but given that physical activity patterns change with uh, levels of disease severity, we can develop validated algorithms that are, are clinically interpretable that correlate your patterns of activity with your level of disease severity. Uh, and then lastly, developing some of those digital interventions such as coaching or self-management for those periods when you need it most. So uh, thank you very much indeed for listening. And to summarize in Remora One, we've generated proof of the transformative value or potential from integrated symptom tracking um, into clinical consultations. And in the next few years, there's still lots to do prior to widespread adoption, um, but we think that there's huge opportunities coming up uh, for self-management, clinical care and research as we develop more scalable infrastructure and generate stronger evidence that this is a good thing to do. So thank you very much for listening.